Hi, you know, a long time ago when I was about nine or ten in about fourth grade at primary school, I remember that uh, one day a religious person came to talk to us about God. And he gave us some lecture, I vaguely remember it. But I do remember that at the end he gave us a chance to ask some questions. And you know, I was open to spirituality and God at that time and very curious. And I asked a typical fourth grader question. I said, you know, if God was so powerful, then why does he let all these bad things happen to people around us? Now, I vaguely remember the question, but the answer is forever etched in my mind. I distinctly remember him saying to me, look, it is not your place to ask questions like that about God. You have to have faith that God has a plan for you. Well, you can imagine I was a bit put out and shut down. And I think in that instant, I decided to become an atheist. I thought religion is not for me. If religion asks you to have faith in them and they're not even willing to answer certain questions that you have and just tell you you have to have blind faith, then I didn't want to have anything to do with religion or spirituality. And it wasn't for another 15 years later that I began to take a further interest in spirituality. So he lost a convert that day, but I have uh, considered that same question because there are a lot of people who do take their religion on a faith basis. And many uh, traditions around the world do rely on people having this uh, faith, unquestionable faith in whatever God or philosophy uh, they propose. And I do think that as we go more and more into uh, this millennia, that there are two real problems with this faith-based approach. Now, don't get me wrong, I actually in some ways envy people who are uh, totally faithful and, and have this, you know, underlying confidence that they are true to their spirituality. But as an engineer for 20 years, I've grown up with a very sort of logical mind. I mean, when I did engineering, you know, if we calculate the bending moment, in a steel reinforced beam and that bending moment is greater than the uh, withstanding force of the cross section of the beam, we know the beam will fail. And there's an exact formula, you can calculate it almost to the very neutron, uh, and Newton, sorry. And so I take that process to religion as well. If people can't tell me why, for example, you need to confess your sins or pray three times a day or whatever, I question, uh, you know, whether we should do that if there's not a logical answer. It's just the way my mind works that I want to see the evidence that, you know, A goes to B goes to C, that sort of thing. And I think that there are more and more people with this kind of logical, even skeptical mindset coming into the world today. And that is going to be a problem for faith based spiritualities. And I believe there's a solution, which I'll get to in a moment. But I think that's one problem. The other problem, of course, with faith, faith based uh, spirituality is uh, and we've seen this throughout the ages, all the conflict that arises. If you say that my God is the only true God, and if you don't believe in my God and have faith, then you will go to hell. And the other person says, no, my God's the best God. Obviously, that's going to result in conflict. And with more and more of the world mixing together in a melting pot, you know, if we have uh, this blind faith towards our own religion that is only going to cause more conflict. So what is the solution? I believe strongly that there is a solution. Uh, it's a solution which is still very, very spiritual and brings you into a state of spirituality, but it is also rooted in logic. 
And that is the act of meditation. I believe meditation could be the answer that all spiritual practices are looking for. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to a particular uh, part of meditation developed by a man called Asanga 1,500 years ago. Now, Asanga was a great meditator, and not only was he able to reach uh, extremely rare states of meditation, he wrote in a great amount of detail how to get there step by step. And in particular, he created what's called the nine stages of meditation, which a meditator goes through as they go from being a complete beginner all the way to the deepest states of meditation. Now, since that time, 1,500 years ago, there have been literally thousands, tens tens of thousands, I don't know, but lots and lots of meditators that have gone through that process and verified that these stages are in fact true for you know these many thousands of people so it's a very evidence-based very logical sequence of going from a chaotic mind to a still mind and to a mind which is open to spiritual experiences now i'm not going to go into detail on this particular video into the uh, nine stages but i would like to break it down a little bit just so I can show you how I believe these nine stages could potentially be a really great asset for all traditions if we can all adopt this uh, you know technique of meditation in, in particular going through the nine stages. So of the nine stages and this is really a gross generalization but there is truth in what I'm saying the first three stages are really about training and and stilling the mind and bringing the mind to a single object to get rid of what we call the monkey mind. That is the highly distracted mind that keeps jumping from, you know, what we're going to have to lunch to, you know, what our mother said to us to what we have to do at work, that sort of thing. And as we focus on a meditation object, typically something like the breath, We bring our mind to stay more and more concentrated on uh, this particular meditation object and so that less and less, we're, we're less and less taken away by our distractive mind. So that is the first three stages of that. And anyone can practice those first three stages. Uh, You can do it at home. And by practicing those three stages, you will get many of the benefits that uh, professionals talk about, such as uh, more focus, more creativity, much less stress, higher performance in sport, those sorts of things. Again, I won't go into in much detail of the benefits of mind mindfulness. Now, after stage three, it starts to get interesting, however. In stage four and five, again, this is a generalization, but this is a stage of purification and pacification of the mind, where our mind has uh, is able to stay on the breath, breathing in and breathing out, for example, but we've still got this background thought patterns going on. Now, as we start to reduce those those mental uh, thoughts and those mental patterns, a whole lot of uh, long-held, deep-seated patterns arise, which have frankly quite disturbed us our whole life. Now, it's these same patterns which have caused us all our problems throughout life and it's these patterns that we go to therapists to try to get them to fix and uh, many of you know that I'm a life coach and so I do therapy with people to try to help them with things like uh, anxiety and jealousy and fear and limiting decisions about themselves you know looking at all these different patterns that we create when we're young And so in stage four and five, I think there is a great role for therapists of all different flavors. And I'm not saying, you know, different people uh, are attracted to different types of uh, therapy, whether it's, you know, NLP or 
uh, you know, acceptance and commitments therapy or Reiki or spiritual healing or whatever, uh, to help them get over these mental patterns that have been with them their whole life. And this has two benefits, of course. First of all, as with any therapy, it gets rid of your emotional baggage. So you're much better able to function in uh, and be happier in real life. But it also helps in, uh, if you're a meditator, in stilling the mind and keeping us, uh, getting us into a deeper state of meditation. So that's stages four and five. Now, from stage six onwards, we're really getting into some of the sort of really deeper stages of meditation. And it's a process which we call unification of mind. And it's a little bit like those uh, distractive parts of the mind that says, hey, don't forget to worry about this particular issue and think about your next uh, purchase or shopping you know, trip or whatever. Those parts that used to be distraction, not only are they becoming quiet, but they are starting to be harnessed into the process of focusing the mind on the object. So they, those parts of the mind that used to distract us now actually start working for us. And for this reason, they call it unification of the mind. And uh, I've heard the metaphor used, it's like a team of horses that were once fighting against each other, now not only become are quiet, that stage is four and five, but actually are now starting to get trained and all pulling in the same direction. And at this point, uh, the mind starts to become exponentially powerful. And it's here where you start to experience, you know, deep states of bliss. And at this stage, you also experience profound knowledge and insights into your mind. And in fact, spiritual experiences. And at this stage, uh, I think that uh, what's important to know is it is great at this stage to have those uh, discussions about spirituality based on real life experiences. And this gets back to the second point that I talked about, the problem with faith uh, fighting over each other is because up until this point, we argue over hearsay. You know, my Bible says this versus the Quran says this versus the, you know, uh, whatever other holy texts there are, uh, the Ramayana or, or whatever. We interpret what we think it says, and then we argue with other people who also are interpreting what they think their text says or what their priest used to tell them. And so we're arguing over hearsay. So here we're arguing over real life experiences. And at this stage, there's far less chance for, the, for there to be argument because of a number of reasons. The first reason is because when you're experiencing states of bliss, relaxation and happiness, you are not in a mood. You've just, basically, you've wiped out a lot of the traces of anger and hatred that would cause you to want to go into conflict. So you're a very, very, uh, you know, passive, open minded person to start with. So you're not going to get into conflict. And the second reason is because it's based on spiritual experience. As I said, you're arguing, you know, real stuff real experiences and you can't deny that if another person says they've experienced that then we've got to somehow explain that in your tradition and then the final point of course is that inevitably a lot of these spiritual experiences turn out to be the same uh, from person to person so whether you are whatever tradition or religion you come from if you're having the same types of feelings of bliss and the same insights, then you're bound to see the commonalities of where your traditions can come together to help each other rather than argue which one is correct or not. And then finally, there's one more point which might be a bit controversial, but I think could help have meditation be a unifying force for all traditions around the globe. 
and that is that generally speaking I would say if you could clearly identify these nine stages um, and from personal experience it's quite clear when you're uh, going from one stage to the other and I think that by speaking to people you can sort out who is on what stage now it I don't go into it because it changes you know one month you might be on a certain stage and then a few days later you'll be at a different stage but in any case if we can sort of somehow validate that people are at least on sort of stage six seven eight and even nine then I think we can have a lot more trust in the uh, for one of a better word the goodness or the uh, high-mindedness of that individual uh, the other problem in the world that we see is that people or in organizations in spiritual traditions you know are embezzling funds and engaging in pedophilia and all of these crimes because they've just been placed there because of study even though they may not have strong insight realizations in their own mind they just uh, say the right words and they get into these positions of power now I think that if we could verify that people are able to reach these high stages of meditation it's not foolproof I imagine that there could be still um, people who might want to take advantage of a situation if they get to high stages but as a general level one could uh, say that you are more likely to trust a spiritual teacher that has been able to accomplish these higher levels of meditative training than someone who hasn't so that's the last feature that is possibly a way to get around some of the difficulties that we see in the world with all the different spiritual uh, traditions and the problems that we're having right now so I'd really like to know your opinion on uh, what I've talked about. Can meditation be a unifying force of uh, meditation? Uh, sorry, a unifying force of religion around the world? Let me know your comments below. Send me an email if you agree or disagree. Um, and hopefully, if we can get meditation into the hands of more and more people and people can work through these stages sequentially we will gradually start seeing a lessening of tension more peace and happiness in the world which is good for everybody so thanks very much and I hope you enjoyed this video